fiction, uh, but whenever I read a science fiction novel, I, it always occurs to me, well, can it really be done? And so each year, the Beyond Center puts on a science fact meets science fiction lecture where we try uh, to see the intersection between these two subjects. And it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker to you, Gregory Benford. I've known Greg since uh, the previous century, way back, uh, in fact, since the 1970s, uh, when he was a postdoc in Cambridge. Uh, he's now Professor of Physics at UC Irvine. He's a Woodrow Wilson Fellow. He has something called the Lord Prize, awarded by God, I suppose. Uh, and uh, in addition to uh, his work as a, a physicist, both experimental and theoretical, uh, I should say he ran the, uh, the plasma physics lab at UC Irvine for 20 years, is that right? Uh, together with his twin brother, Jim Benford, uh, so twin physicists, uh, with glittering careers, but very varied careers. So uh, Greg is probably known to many of you from his science fiction. Uh, he's written about 40 books, he's actually lost count, uh, some of which are on sale outside. Uh, the most recent one, which I enjoyed uh, greatly, is an alternative history of the Manhattan Project uh, in World War II. Many students these days don't even know what the Manhattan Project was. Um, and uh, we just picked up the trade paperback and it says on the front, no one has ever been better than Mr. Benford. It, that's the Wall Street Journal. It doesn't say better at what, but we, <laughs> we, we assume it means a, as a writer. Um, I, I could spend a lot of time uh, because uh, Greg has had uh, uh, many embellishments around his uh, career. Uh, he, uh, like a lot of important people these days, he has a Russian connection. Uh, <laughs> although he strenuously denies reports that the character of James Bond was based on his exploits in the Soviet Union, but we'll see if he'll uh, say something about that a little later on. Uh, the way we're going to handle the evening is that he's going to give us a, a, a bold vision for how to solve the big problems facing us in the 21st century. Uh, and then he and I are going to sit down uh, and visit some of these other more exotic topics. And then we'll throw the uh, evening open to questions from the floor. So I'm not going to say any more. I've already used up too much of your time. So uh, please welcome Greg Benford. A history lesson from 205 years ago to give you some perspective. I'm going to talk about what I believe will be two of the major opportunities to solve our problems in the next century. And I'd remind you that uh, this quotation at the top by Thomas Jefferson, it was taken in a letter he sent to Congress to tell them, even though they just lived down the street, th that Lewis and Clark had returned from their expedition to find out what was out there in this recent purchase. Uh, we got this at uh, literally a fire sale by Napoleon, who needed the money to invade Russia. Uh, so, you could always make a profit out of your enemy's mistakes. Notice that Illinois is still a territory. Unclaimed territory means we were fighting with, uh, we were not actually fighting, we were not even there, it, that the British and the Russians claimed it, both. Uh, the Russians, we end up actually buying some stuff for them, and uh, uh, later on we bought Alaska. Spain had all this. Not Mexico, Spain. Uh, and here is the way the perspective of even the genius Thomas Jefferson had. Thousand years to reach the ocean, by which he meant the Pacific, because there was not even actually a standard terminology for it yet. Uh, the slide doesn't seem to move. <laughs> ah. Did you switch How's it off? How's that? Did I switch it off? Ah. Yes, it says on. Yeah. And you have a laser pointer that works very well. So you but, use that, but it's not advancing. So well. some more time to study the map. It's what? not advancing. There we go. There we go. Okay. Oh, you did it here. The, I, would, I come from Mobile, Alabama, which down there is in disputed territory between, <laughs> with Spain. Thank you. Right. Now, slow, shortly before you, uh, this, and, and Jefferson knew this, he'd read about it in the newspapers, the first locomotive 
commercially started operating in England. So Jefferson knew about that. And here's where the railroad was in 1869. 65 years later, we had already crossed the entire continent. You could take a train to the ocean <laughs> that quickly. It's, my point here is that in our national experience, there is an explosive growth that is in fact still occurring in some parameter spaces. And it ended up like looking like this. Notice that we, we got the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, in the Mexican War of 1845, we uh, were actually invaded by Mexico, which crossed the Rio Grande in force under the command of General Santa Ana. One of, the, one of history's classic big mistakes, <laughs> because he had not realized the United States had already sent troops into Texas, which was a state of the Union. Texas had already beaten the Mexican army under Santa Ana. You know, it's beyond expression what bad judgment one man had. On the other hand, always profit from the mistakes of your enemies. And uh, we got the rest of the country, largely from Mexico. I looked up the population of California in 1850, first time anybody had ever done a census. Order of magnitude, how many think it was a million people? How many think it was 100,000 people? How many 10 million people? Well, it was 73,000 people in the whole state of California, which now has 40 million people in it, more or less. In other words, the population then is essentially a rounding error in our counting now. Um, this is what we made of that territory. And of course, in the expansion of any new enterprise into a whole frontier, there are going to be mistakes. And I would remind you that I'm going to talk about optimistically about big opportunities we have in this century to solve problems. What problem was the railroad made to solve? It was made to move resources around very quickly, and also people, and also food. And the problems confronting us in this century are the rising rate of population increase, that is to say the population curve is slowing very little, but it is already projected to go over 10 billion. We have a bit over 7 billion right now. <clears throat> and we have climate change. We need more resources for people because they want to live well. People in uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, South America would like to have the air conditioning, heating, and, and appliances and properties that you have. And so the demand is always going to be there, and that's bad news for climate change, which I will treat a little bit later. I'm going to talk more futuristically then about this frontier. That is to say, the one that's immediately within view above this thin skin of atmosphere. This is, of course, our planets, our planet. This is where we live. And it's going to be for a very long time the only place we live, I think. And we're not going to have large colonies, a large meaning say, larger than the population of California in, in 1850, 73,000, anywhere in the solar system, probably. I su su suggest that's probably going to be true in the next century, just because there's no big economic advantage to having a large human colony anywhere above the atmosphere. Not, maybe not even in low Earth orbit, if you eliminate the hotel and tourism trade. That's the one caveat. I, myself, actually, uh, when I had dinner with Elon Musk some months ago, I said, uh, could I buy a ticket now to go up to the Bigelow Hotel? And he said, why? I mean, we don't even have the hotel up yet, although it will be in a couple of years. And I said, well, frankly, Elon, I'm looking for a discount. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, I'll give you 10%. Um, <laughs> he actually did say that. Uh, uh, this is the perspective I'm invoking. I like this slide because you can see that the how vastly our horizons have expanded. Here's the actual horizon. And that slanted glow over there is the zodiac of the solar system. That's the plane of the solar system. And that curved object up there is the Milky Way, the plane of the galaxy. So you see the three major scales of the, the human being, beings can possibly see all in one shot. And of course, it was, as I recall, it was shot in uh, Germany, although it could, could be the Alps. I'm, I've actually forgotten. Oh, by the way, there's a human being down there for scale. <laughs> Maybe you didn't notice him. Um, 
I want to point out to you that the idea of going into space and it was on the, the frontier is a very old one. This is Disneyland, right? The opening day. The big metaphor they used for the future was a rocket. Suspiciously resembling the V2, you'll notice, <laughs> which was our primary mold in that era. This is before NASA, before the space program, before Sputnik. And the ideas I'm going to talk about are talked about in some significant measure, at least the space frontier, in this book, which is, will be on sale outside, which my brother and I edited. Starship century means this century. The point being, at the end of this century, it's, there's a very real possibility that humanity will be able to build a ship that will go to the stars. Probably not manned or womaned. But if we develop the resources of the inner solar system, we will do two things. First, we will have opened up the resources that are far larger than all those in the crust of the Earth, the resources such as metals and rare earths, which are increasingly needed. 90% of all the rare earths in the, known in, on the planet are in the hands of the Chinese, one nation, a communist nation. And they're trying to, to actually get a good hold on the rare earth deposits known in Africa. Um, metals, the platinum group of metals, are, are already, already very expensive and they're getting more rare. All kinds of things are getting more rare, even copper. Um, but the asteroids have a lot of metals in them and nobody owns them. The general interpretation of the rights to whatever lies above our atmosphere are to some extent governed by the space treaty. But the general way of treating it, which uh, most of the major nations now comply with, is that it's like a sea treaty. You, nobody owns the oceans, but something you get out of the ocean, such as fish or derelict ships, can belong to you. That seems to be the prevailing economics idea, and I'm going to assume that that will occur. Now, since I showed you a bunch of maps, here's a map of the uh, region around the, the Earth. The Earth's over there. L1 and L2 are the Lagrange points, the points of a weak equilibrium in the gravity between, in this case, the Sun, the Earth, and the Moon. Uh, in w these are places that are fairly stable, so you can sit there for a long time and you're not actually in a rapid orbit around any body. They're L5 and L3 points. L3 is on the other side of the solar system. So the idea is to see all this as a landscape. And what are the lines about? It's the gravitational potential. It's how much energy you have to expend to move around in it. So you can see it as a topological map. Here's the same thing as though it was a piece of land. Here's the Earth and the Moon down here. Uh, you can, in terms of energy expenditure, think that it takes energy to climb up a hill. And so you can see the Earth down here as the energy actually which it takes to climb out of the pit, the gravitational pit that, gravity, that the Earth is. The Moon is a lesser one over there. And there are other targets that you could see. There's Mars with Phobos and Deimos. Oh, I have a pointer. Yeah, I do have a pointer. Uh, whoop. Yeah. No, no, I'm not doing it right. Oh, it's a, yeah, this is high tech. Uh, how do we go back to the? How do we go back to that? Yes. The, uh, well, focusing on the map. There's Venus. There's the Sun. What do you have to do? <laughs> Press that thing just under the little window. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the go window. Back there. You're okay. giving the game away. So that's okay. Fine. Here we go. Oh. Good. So I press you got it? that one. Yes. That one. Okay. So well, you already found it. Here's Venus. There are various other places that are gravitational equilibria, and out here is the belt of the asteroids, which sounds like an old bad serial, doesn't it? Uh, Ceres, the largest asteroid, is there. It's actually a round object. It has so much mass. So the belt of the asteroids is where the great resources of the solar system lie. And the idea that we would go into space and do this is a very old, particularly American idea. The first idea about living in space was produced by an American in this book. Of course, he thought we'd make it out of bricks. Okay, not right. But close enough for government work. And you'll notice it's very close to the time when we opened the railroad to the West. An interesting resonance of expectations. Uh, the concepts I'm going to talk about, I was introduced 
to by the art of Chesley Bonestell, a really great painter, the first great astronomical painter. And this is his ideas from Life magazine in the mid-1950s, same time as the Disneyland opening, about how he would bring, build these hub-like space stations, which are rotating so you get artificial gravity, which we still haven't achieved, by the way, due to, uh, shall we say, certain lacks in certain government agencies. You'll notice that Panama is down there. Um, and we honestly thought, Von Braun thought, we would need these giant fins to get around in rockets because they would glide back down and be recovered. As, in fact, the first stage is now recovered by Elon Musk with tiny little fins. So the idea was there, but, but the whole idea of that spaceships were going to be like winged craft was still around. That's conceptually how long ago it was. Um, so I'll just cut to the economic chase and say the things you can see right now will be vital in the space utilization of resources, which I'll get to, are first nuclear rockets operating only in space, not in the atmosphere. And the reason to use nuclear rockets is that they're far more efficient. They're almost four times more efficient than things like liquid oxygen and hydrogen rockets such as we use now, the big boosters such as the Apollo boosters. Four times more efficient. And if you're worried about the fact that they're nuclear, I would point out to you that the entire rest of the solar system is, nuclear, is full of radiation. <laughs> this is the only place in the solar system, except the deep atmospheres of Venus, in which there isn't a lot of radiation. <laughs> so it's a, radiation's a real danger in space. Using nuclear rockets is not going to pollute anything more than it's already polluting. The idea of nuclear rockets is you use the radioactive materials to simply heat up something simple like water and blow it out the back. Or if you want to get more lift, you use hydrogen or oxygen, something like that. Um, so it's really a steam rocket. Remember, all rockets launched from the surface of the Earth are steam rockets. So they are steam powered. The other idea we're going to need is space robots. Because we're not going to do the work. The robots are going to do the work. Because they can stand to live in a radioactive zero-G environment for a very long time. And they have no retirement plan. <laughs> And then 3D printers. How are you going to get stuff? Well, there's a lot of mass in the solar system. If you can get the proper mass, light metals, things like that, you can print replacement parts in place using the information sent to you wirelessly from the Earth. So 3D printing will inevitably be a big issue. Notice that these things already exist. And by the way, the nuclear rockets that the United States developed starting in the 1960s are sitting in a warehouse in Nevada, and we still have them. So are the classified rockets we discussed, we developed, which I worked on briefly in the 1990s. So were the Soviet ro nuclear rockets that they developed in semi palatinsk So this stuff is known stuff. The performance of nuclear rockets is actually very good. And everybody wants to go. <laughs> you recognize this guy. He, unlike me, got a free ride on what used to be called a vomit comet, in which you only get 20 to 30 seconds of zero G, but he obviously liked it. This is not in orbit, <laughs> by the way. So, uh, and, and that's Stephen, he said he felt the freest he had ever been <laughs> to be without gravity, which I think is a great idea. What resources are we talking about? This is a conceptualization of a harvester, robotic craft, in the asteroid belt, it's got a scoop over a portion of the asteroid, and it will do things like apply heat to it and extract minerals and metals and even water. There's actually a lot of water in some of the asteroids. Water is very useful in space because you could break it into oxygen and hydrogen and use it in an ordinary rocket. You can also use it to breathe <laughs> or to stay clean. Notice, and this is, I think, an anachronism, uh, 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 a, uh, an anachronism, that there are a lot of solar panels these here. Actually, I don't think solar panels are, will be a lot of use in the asteroid belt because it's further from the sun, and nuclear power is far more effective and much less weighty. And this is essentially an operation that is harvesting light elements and maybe some metals or some rare earths. All that technology, how you extract it from such objects as this, we actually already have because the United States leads the world in mining technologies. Um, 
And so up close, you can have grapplers like this that adhere to an asteroid. And the benefit of zero G is that you don't have to have structures that have to support themselves against weight. And so you can devote the entire thing to the mechanical functions of extracting metals or other things from an asteroid surface. Also, you, can, you don't have to move around on it because you can, you can secure yourself in zero G to an asteroid. This is all, in, ideally anyway, entirely robotically managed. And here you can see near a, man, a mining emplacement on an asteroid an idea about how you would build a human habitat in case you actually did need humans. But humans don't do well in zero G. We know now that if you sent people on a, the minimum energy orbit to Mars, and they arrived there in about half a year, they would not be able to walk when they got to the surface because zero G is bad for you. We've spent half a century proving that. It's time to move on to do centrifugal gravity, and you can do it with a spinning artifact such as this. This is a combination of that Bonestell von Braun image with asteroid mining. Um, now, where are the asteroids? This is a simple illustration that the asteroid belt is out that way, but there are other rogue astronauts, uh, uh, asteroids rather, that come in fairly close to the Earth, moving at relatively low velocities. Those will be the first ones exploited. And we already know where they are and we know what's in them. Why? Because we get the spectrographic data from them all the time as they pass by. We know the mineral content of most of these asteroids. And the point is, we know it because they're homogeneously mixed up, we believe. That is, there are various inhomogeneities in it, but for the most part, what you see is what you're going to get. The asteroids have not separated gravitationally. Well, a few of the larger ones, like Ceres, have, but most of them are simply big rock piles and other things that you can pick apart and find what you need which is, by the way, much easier than mining something in a gravitational field like this, because you have to dig into mountains, and they tend to cave in on you, and things like that. So asteroids are, in some ways, actually easier to work on, and, you, and therefore the robots will, have to not be, will not have to be as strong as we are. Here's an example. It has the romantic name of a CG2. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it's quite large. Its uh, size is somewhere between one and 365 meters across. That's huge. That's really large. That's many, many megatons of weight. It's Apollo in the sense that it comes cl close to the Earth's orbit. The time to get there under low propulsion is 10 months, but if you're sending robots, they don't need entertainment, right? <laughs> or life supplies. They can take their time to get there. And you can probably, and this is, due to an economic analysis of what you would do with this thing, you could probably get a return on it in four and a half years. If you launched a mining expedition from New York to California after the gold rush, uh, the return of five years was, was kind of the standard expectation. You send a crew out, they've got to dig the mine, they've got to process the ore, and then they've got to ship it back. So it's the same time scale as was common in the middle of the 19th century for getting your money back on an investment. The next launch to go look at it, by the way, is in July of 2020, and the delta V is about five kilometers a second, which is not a big deal, uh, particularly in low orbit. And this is an actual picture of an asteroid which looks like a good target. Notice this just really an amorphous lump, and there are no alien messages written on it or uh, anything else, and uh, there is no natural environment deserving of preservation. It's just a big space rock. So this is an idea of what the orbits of asteroids look like. You'll notice that it's a huge swarm. There are many, many asteroids. Most of them are in the range of a few hundred meters across, or maybe a few kilometers. Ceres is very big in the 200 kilometers range. And here's, down here, is uh, our good old Earth, and you'll notice that many of the asteroids go even closer into the further solar system and then back out. But the density of asteroids around the Earth is actually quite large because they come sloping in on elliptical orbits, and while they're passing nearby, or nearby in either position space or velocity space, you can actually jump on them and go for a ride. And you can jump off 
when you want to take the metals or whatever you've harvested home. So this we can do. We know how to do changes of orbits in the solar system. <clears throat> and in fact, there are probably economic ways to make it easy. This is a picture of a giant solar sail. And there's the payload way down there, which is, ah, oh, I have a pointer. Yeah, let's be sure I don't turn it off, right? The pay payload is here. It's held by a cable you can't see. It's secured up there. And this is a solar sail that can, on a scale of about two, about two years, return the payload to low Earth orbit on its own with no fuel, just using sunlight to push itself around. That eliminates the need to return anything to the Earth. You send the robots out, they mine the wealth, you send the sail from low Earth orbit, sails for free out to the asteroid, it gets loaded up with cargo, and it brings it back. That's a no-cost return. It just takes time. So it's possible to use sunlight to mine the entire solar system if you're willing to take a slow return. Uh, now, every time you see a talk about some big technology, I would remind you of this kind of law, which I think is a reasonable law. It's uh, <clears throat> the hype cycle. So you, you, you know how it is in the techno-scientific culture. You start off with a really good idea. Gosh, it's going to be great. It's going to change the world. Blah, blah, we're going to get rich. And not just in Silicon Valley. Um, so the visibility goes way up as the expectations go up. And there's in inevitably an overinflation. Remember the collapse right after 1999 going into 2000 where the tech industry started to suddenly plunge because you realize it was not the gold rush we thought it was. Nonetheless, the great companies have been built since, Google, Facebook, and so forth, after this overinflated expectation. So right after those expectations, we plunged into the trough of disillusionment where, my God, what were we thinking? The internet's not really going to be worth a lot of money. And by the way, that's roughly where all those big companies were founded <laughs> by guys working out of garages. Um, without even a decent PhD among them. <laughs> then there follows an era that we're now in on, on the internet, the slope of enlightenment, where you realize that the model is going to be somewhat different than what you thought, but the essence of it is, say, with the internet, people get, can have high connectivity, they can, they can get things that they didn't even know existed before, trading can occur, occur more freely, you see, the, the basic story of the economics of the last several centuries has not been the rise of capitalism so much as has been the rise of free markets and guaranteed ownership, which is what's necessary for a market to operate. Um, uh, for the economists among you, uh, the, the Soviet Union was actually a state capitalist system. It was a capitalist system owned only by the state and run very poorly, and it crashed <laughs> because it didn't have free markets and it didn't have information. And you hit what we're, I think, going to be approaching, I hope, fairly soon in the internet. But this, the, the virtue of this curve is, I think, will also describe what happens to mining the solar system and getting resources from it. The plateau of productivity, which just goes on and on and on and on. For example, we're still mining a lot of things in the United States. We haven't run out of stuff. What the stuff that we want has changed. It used to be just coal and copper. Now it's lots more diversified, like the rare earths. Why are they called rare? Because they really are rare. And we're running out of them. <laughs> and we're going to need them. And if you want to solve the economic problems of the masses, the billions of people who want to live the way we live, you're going to need these resources, or else you're going to have a lot of trouble. Alas, uh, <clears throat> oh, here's a, another example of the 1986 DA. This is the date that they were discovered and, and explored. The interesting thing is um, that this object, this little thing, which is 1.4 miles across, contains over a million tons of platinum metals, the rarest class of metals commonly used in our economy, with an Earth's surface market value of today of about $100 trillion. The entire GDP of the planet last year was around $58 trillion, I think. In other words, this is more than the productivity of the entire planet. And of course, all the amateur economists will always say, but if you return this whole thing at once, you'll crash the market. Well, that's absolutely true. And by the way, it occurred to people in the gold rush, too. <laughs> they didn't bring all the gold out of California immediately. First, they couldn't. They didn't have it all. But what you do is you, a thing that miners have known for centuries, 
you return it at the rate that it yields the most return, but you satisfy the market so it doesn't go away. That's what markets do. They're equilibrium enforcers. enforcers. So this is a small metallic near-Earth orbit, a near-Earth object, NEA. This is not just another government bureau. It means near-Earth asteroid, meaning we can reach this readily, and it's got an enormous value in metals. And you can extract it, well, I hope by the time we, we do this, with robots. Robots that will function like this. And by the way, this is also the prospect which people typically think about uh, in asteroids, is suppose you hit the Earth with one. Well, there are actually good reasons to bring an, Earth, uh, an asteroid somewhere near the Earth, because if you hollow it out and take all the resources out, and by the way, you can throw some of the rock and other stuff, debris you have out the back in electromagnetic rockets, so you can actually move it at no cost. You don't have to use fuel. You can just throw the stuff you don't want as you hollow out the asteroid behind you and use that for propulsion. The point is, this is a place the humans could live in space, and they don't have to build it. It's a found object. Some of the asteroids we strongly believe, because they underwent a melting phase, are actually fairly strong. So you can spin it like a spinning cylinder and have people secure it on the inside, and you can have a colony. And it's be, but it will be built not of materials brought from the Earth, but of those brought from the asteroid belt. So it's like the old Western pioneers. The re reason that the railroads worked in going into the American West is you could haul a lot of weight for very little expenditure of fuel, and you could live off the land. Well, we can live off the land, the solar system, once we've secured the economic base of metals, and we have a source of water, and we could do agriculture, and so forth. Why people will live in space is going to be an interesting question. I don't know. There will probably be some economic reason to do it, but it's like trying to guess why would people build skyscrapers in San Francisco when you just finished fighting the Civil War? You're really just, you're, you're getting ahead of yourself. Water and metals, this is the same shot. I would rem to remind you that water is a pro propellant, and therefore, this can be the feedstock for an entire human colony as well if it's used nearby. You know, as you bring an asteroid in, and you just mine it for resources that you need for a colony that's off the screen. And now I'm going to go to the second theme. <laughs> I always like to show people maps. This is a map of where I live. But it's a map of where I live after the poles have melted. <laughs> because the other thing that's going to happen with the human population is that there are going to be a lot of people with expectations, and the ocean of water, uh, of air we live in, is getting polluted with good old CO2. There's some other things, but CO2 is the major problem. <clears throat> I live, uh, let's see, let's see where. I know, but I'm trying to find out where I am on the map. This is uh, Palos Verdes, where the rich people live in Los Angeles. And I live down here, <laughs> uh, in fact, just about right there. So if I, uh, so if I head for the hills, I'm OK. But other, uh, otherwise, I'm included in all the rest of the people. This is all, all the Sea of Orange County. This is the Bay of Los Angeles. Here's a little island in Baldwin Island. And we're all the way up to Hollywood, by the way, is preserved. You'll be grateful for that. <laughs> um, and here is uh, all those rich people in Santa Monica. This is what happens to their property. So, so you stay here, you're safe. <laughs> but this is what will happen if we allow Antarctica to melt. Assuming, of course, Greenland and so forth will melt before that. Um, the reason to think this would happen is because of some charts I'll show you a little later. Because if we, if we keep on putting CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, the CO2 doesn't go away readily. Some of it is absorbed by the oceans, and that's the other problem. It's turning the oceans more acidic, and we're already le losing the coral reefs in parts. I went diving in uh, the Southern Caribbean in December. I was astonished at the extent of the damage that I saw there, uh, which had not been there a decade before when I was diving in the same place. Um, so the point is the, the change is rapid. This is the kind of thing you can expect if we just keep putting CO2 in the atmosphere unless we do something about it. And so the second big problem, if you have to think big about, is you have to think about the entire system of the world. <clears throat> the mass of the air on our planet 
is only slightly larger than the mass of the water in the Mediterranean Sea alone. So you see the, the atmosphere is actually the smallest mass in the active biology of the planet. And that's why it's the place where our own problems first appear, because we've been throwing stuff into it, assuming it's an infinite resource, but it's not. So it's only slightly more mass than the Mediterranean Sea. And we've seen what has happened to the Mediterranean Sea just from casual abuse. So it's not unexpected, although of course we didn't expect it, uh, <laughs> that we would get into trouble with our own atmosphere. Here's the expectations of um, worst case scenario. This is this, a set of various expectations issued uh, in a study of, that considered the 1990s. And this, uh, this curve here is the actual event. This is the big recession of 2008-2009 dropping. Um, oh, the, uh, the axis here is CO2 emissions per year in billions of tons of carbon dioxide. Point is, this is what actually happened, and you'll notice it's curiously close to the absolute worst expectations of the economists of the 1990s. It's still that way. Um, and we didn't come remotely close to what the optimists thought we might be able to achieve by restricting CO2. The problem of uh, climate change is, is the problem that you get a lot of benefits out of fossil fuels, and putting it into the uh, CO2 into the atmosphere is the classic tragedy of the commons. That is, everybody overuses that which is commonly owned because there's no downside. You get the benefit, other people get the detriment. And when everybody does it, it means everybody gets the detriment. That's the essence of our problem. It, the, the metaphor comes from the Boston commons long ago when it was legal to graze your cow on it, right? So everybody grazed the cow on it, and pretty soon there was no grass. So they had to make up a commons law. That's why it's now called the commons. And here's what has happened more recently, running up to 2015. These, you'll notice all the stuff up here, uh, this is oil right here. Here's oil going up. Here's coal, still rising, you'll notice, even though with all the restrictions. Why is this happening? This from 2005 to about 2015, China and India and the third world generally. We're cutting down, for the most part, on coal emissions. In California, we have a a lot of virtue signaling going on. We're making great progress in renewables, <clears throat> except, of course, we're actually importing electrical power from every state that is our neighbor. The number one importer who produces a great deal of electricity for, is, uh, for us uh, is you, Arizona, where you're burning a lot of coal and shipping it, the electrons, to California. Of course, you have solar panels and so forth, too. But notice that the Renewables are way down here. And you'll notice that they're not really increasing very much. The, the point about pointing to the past is to say, we're going to have to do enormously better if we're going to do very much at all, because the real truth of the fact is that renewables are a small fraction of the world's production of electrical power. And it's hard to believe that that's going to be true. Uh, uh, tr uh, not going to be true, that is, for a very long time. So, and this, uh, the units here, I've forgotten what this is, but it's, uh, it doesn't matter because it's actually the energy produced by these methods. The thing is, we're going to, we're not making progress. And we've been trying to do this for decades. So, it's time to ask, when you have effects like this, the red is the Arctic sea loss that we have incurred to now. That is to say, the red is what we've lost in the summer in the Arctic, the one region of the world where there actually is a lot of land mass and, it's can, and is exposed not under ice. <clears throat> so the sea ice is getting leaner and leaner. And the reason it's melting, by the way, <clears throat> is that warmer temperatures means there's less snow slow and ice in the Arctic. Snow and ice reflect sunlight, and when they're not there, the tundra absorbs more energy and it warms up. So you get land and sea warmer, and that makes the temperature warmer. This is a positive feedback mechanism, so the situation keeps getting worse. And we, people have been monitoring it for decades. For example, you can light a match to some pools in 
Alaska, and methane will burn because it's bubbling up from the tundra below. So, and this photograph, by the way, is already four years old. All you have to do is light it up. Um, this is, the, it's, uh, sorry, it's a little off axis, but this is the extent of the sea ice versus time, and it runs all the way down to about 2012. I just drew the straight line to point out that there's year-to-year -year variation, but the trend is very clear. And what it means is that the Arctic sea ice will probably be gone by 2050. Maybe earlier, maybe a bit later, but roughly 2050. Um, so, how are you going to solve the problem? This is a problem I have worked on for 20 years. It's called geoengineering. It means engineering the entire planet. Um, you'll notice that what we're doing now is actually geoengineering. It's just inadvertent geoengineering. The world, climate is shifting because of what we're doing. It's just that we're not doing it intentionally. It's a side effect. The proposal to do geoengineering to correct our own previous geoengineering is what is on the table now. It's still politically unpopular, and it doesn't give you great visuals like space resources, but it is doable. And in fact, I worked on both sides of this. There are two kinds of geoengineering, basically, to simplify. One is capture carbon out of the air and put it someplace where it won't come back. I worked on taking farm waste, because I grew up on a farm in southern Alabama, and it would round up corn stalks, stuff like that, and you just put them in a ditch, and you come back a month later, and it's all gone, because it's gone into the atmosphere. Turns out the yearly variation in CO2 that, are, that goes up and down with the seasons is because it's how much plants are feeding back into the atmosphere after it's captured it in the summer. It takes the CO2 out of the air for a while when you're growing, and then it goes back in when the when the corn stalks uh, rot. This is a picture of uh, high strato clouds uh, in the Arctic, which in this particular case, this cloud, which persisted for days for various weather reasons, actually screened out a part of the Arctic and cooled it down. This is the other kind of geoengineering. Not carbon capture, but actually just reflecting sunlight back so you cool the whole planet. Air conditioning, if you will. And the idea here is to buy time. It's not that this is the final answer to the climate problem. It's that this is the thing you can do right now, and it's very inexpensive, and it will cool the region that is most endangered, which is the Arctic and the Antarctic. Simulations have been done. I won't bother you with those. Of both of these cases, and it turns out for a very small amount of aerosols delivered only in the summer, not permanently, say in the case, uh, will cool the summer and therefore stop the emission of methane from the tundra, which is occurring now, and of course cool the planet as well. So the idea is you do this only for a few months in the summer, you put it into the lower level of the stratosphere, which at the poles is only slightly above where your ordinary airplanes fly, a little above 40,000 feet. Within three or four months, it comes into the troposphere, that's what we're breathing right now, and then rains out, or snows out, and it's gone. Game over. Then you do the same thing for Antarctica when it's summer there. The total cost of this project is a few hundred million dollars a year, which is, on a planetary scale, nothing. Remember, the United States last year produced over $17 trillion worth of wealth. You can do this. It's really cheap. And so, working with my colleagues, Ken Caldera and Lowell Wood, we worked out an agenda to do this. Here's a simple number to think about it. <clears throat> This is, an, uh, this is a simulation, I won't bother you with all the details. It basically showed that if you do this, nothing else much changes in the weather. There's a benefit available at the poles. There's a thing called the, solar, uh, the, the polar vortex. In the summer, the, the winds around the pole primarily go around the pole. Therefore, they don't distribute aerosols, if you put them in, very far to, to the south. So you, actually, the experiment remains fairly well confined. So you can just carry it out in the Arctic and then in the Antarctic. This is the only place in the planet where that's true. The rest of the planet, you have to put the aerosols up much higher, 55 or 60,000 feet, because the stratosphere is much higher over the tropics. And it gets mixed up very quickly on a matter of days. So by pure good luck, the Arctic and the Antarctic, which are the most threatened regions of the planet, where the temperature increase has been the highest, is also the best place to do a controlled experiment. It's just a dead piece of luck. 
Um, and how do you do it? You use these. These are the in-flight refuelers. When you transport fighter jets or presidential airplanes around the planet, they don't land and refuel anywhere. They fly the whole way by being refueled in the air. This is called the KC-10 extender. We have hundreds of them. We can easily do this. We own over 90% of all the ones in the world, just the same as we own about 90% of all the Navy craft in the world. So the point is to imagine at this beginning stage that we start to do small experiments in the climate. In fact, the first such experiment is going to occur here in Arizona next year outside Tucson. It will be run by a friend of mine, David Keith, from Harvard. He will disperse some aerosols, I think, after a mini conversation with David, that it's too few because he's He's in danger of not being able to see any effect at all. It'll be carried out in the stratosphere about 20 kilometers up, and we'll see what happens to it. Actually, we, I think we pretty well know what's going to happen, but that's, you know, the reason you do experiments is, is, to, is to allow yourself to be surprised by reality. <laughs> so what I'm talking about here is the idea that some of us have worked down now for decades that you do limited experience with active science, and at least you learn more through experiment and you can find out more sophisticated ways about how to intervene in the climate, which we know is going to change. And the ultimate job of climate engineers is to give the polit political class options. At the moment, there's nothing on the shelf that they can do except to preach to you about lowering your fossil fuel emissions, and have we seen that ain't working. So the idea I have is basically we should do this because here's what the long-term future looks like. Suppose you put in a carbon emissions, and it peaks. Over here are the various curves of things like, at the top, sea level rise due to ice melting. The seas are going to keep rising because the CO2 will still be there in the air because the CO2 doesn't go away very rapidly. CO2 emissions can drop down here. This is on a scale of a century, the next century. You can drop, but you will still get effects from the total amount of CO2 for centuries. You see. This is a different system than anything else. It is the longest and slowest varying and biggest system we have. It's the whole biosphere, and the atmosphere does not readily change. So CO2 stabilization will have to go on forever, but the effects of really just a couple of centuries of CO2 emissions will persist for centuries, unless we really find a way to pull a lot of CO2 out of the air. And so far, by the way, it's not easy, and it's very expensive, really. Orders of magnitude more expensive than simply blocking sunlight. So that this is what the pessimists, for example, pessimistic scenario with long-term target, well, the pessimistic scenario is this. Business as usual, that is, by the way, let me go through the axis. This is 1980, here's 2050. Many of you will live to see this, I hope to, because then I'll be 109. Uh, um, this is the present, right here. This is business as usual, projected by economists. You'll notice it just keeps on going up. This is a, a <clears throat> pessimistic belief that, well, at best, we can just stabilize and do no more than what we're doing now in emissions per year, and it occurs right away. It, there's a slight rise, but it still stays up there. And this, by the way, is in gigatons of CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere. And here's what the optimists think we should aim for. And indeed, it's a good thing to aim for. I have to admit to you that having seen the record of the last 20 years, I don't think that's much of a chance. That is, this is a really serious problem that crosses many generations, and we had better do something about it, because here's what happens to, um, <coughs> to the uh, temperature projected global temperature increase, this is in degrees centigrade, we're already guaranteed to have this much, one and a half degrees centigrade, for centuries. It's not going to get cooler again for a very long time. This is the target everybody would like, two degrees centigrade, and this is the time axis. Notice that the probable emissions curve, which these are emissions keep on going up, <coughs> um, leads you into this territory on a scale of somewhere between 2020 and 2040, you're certainly above two degrees, and beyond that, you just keep going up. So we've only got a couple more decades before we start to see really serious effects, and it won't go away. It's not though you will start walking to work and still driving, and then it'll get cooler. 
That ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. So that's the severity of the problem. And what I proposed here in geoengineering, without showing the myriad simulations and other stuff, is to say, this is a big problem such as humanity has never faced. Or you might say, well, what about the Ice Ages? Yes, that's true. But <clears throat> actually, in some ways, it was not humanity back there 250,000 years ago. It was precursors of ourselves. We're the smart apes that got out of Africa. Or, as Gerard Diamond says, the third chimpanzee. The ordinary chimp is fairly widespread in Africa, but it never got out. The bonobo chimp is very much confined um, in the jungles. We're the ones who managed to get out. And we have taken over the planet in an amazing way, but we're already doing a lot of damage. So this is a different kind of problem that humanity has ever faced. We've faced overpopulation in places like the Tigris Euphrates Valleys when, um, when in fact, uh, the, the, the agricultural areas collapsed. It's now called the Middle East. It used to be, remember this from grade school, the Fertile Crescent? It ain't fertile anymore, and it's not going to be fertile for a long time. The granary of the Roman Empire is northern Africa, now known as a desert. We did that too. Uh, but this thing is worldwide, and so, but only by taking this perspective of the whole planet, and indeed the whole solar system, do we have a real chance to get our hands around this problem. Our longevity is increasing nicely. We're living longer than ever. But of course, you're going to <laughs> face a worse future the longer you live into it. So now's the time to do something about it. And that's basically my point. And now Paul wants to do a conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Uh, so um, there's so many more interesting things about you, Greg. Can we kill the, the lights on the screen? Um, and I, I don't intend to uh, delay this too much because there'll be questions. But I, I failed to mention that, well, of course... Good. The last modern. You, you, <laughs> Never I, I failed to mention, could we put the lights up at the front here? Yeah. That you, you grew up in occupied uh, Japan and occupied Germany. And yeah. so you had, uh, uh, your father was uh, a very senior uh, officer in the, in the US Army and was in charge of the DMZ at uh, some In the 1960s, right? he commanded the DMZ for right, a year. Right, right. He was in the Second World War and the Korean War under MacArthur. But, but your, your mother turned you away from a military career, and uh, so you became a physicist. And, uh, but one of your early uh, paying jobs was with the real Dr. Strangelove. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I had the fortune of being a graduate student to work with uh, Maria Gepard Mayer, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics since Madame Curie on nuclear physics. And when I got my thesis done in 1967, having gone to UCSD, along with my twin brother in 1963, uh, from 63 to 67, I, uh, Maria, uh, I learned only much later, called up Edward Teller and said, this guy is really good at doing calculations. I know you, you hire calculators to carry out your ideas. In fact, he hired five a year as postdocs. Um, so uh, why don't you have him come up? I went up and interviewed. I thought, well, it's great to meet Edward Teller. That was terrific. He's a very sharp guy. He asked a lot of incisive questions. I went back saying, well, nice to meet him once. This is so long ago that a week later, I got my job offer. <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> but this, I asked, asked at Livermore, and they said, it takes us about a year to hire a postdoc now. <laughs> it took two weeks in 1967. So, but I'd like to leap ahead because of uh, lack of time. And so, um, I, so I alluded to the, the Russian connection. Uh, uh, are you able to talk about your uh, work um, with the CIA? Or, I uh, is carried it out uh, policy incursions, we used to call it, for the State Department and the Central Intelligence Agency because I speak Russian and German. And in the Reagan years, there was a carefully managed uh, campaign to oust the Andropov faction from the Politburo and let Gorbachev come to power. And the Reagan administration was much involved in trying to tilt the opinion of the intelligentsia and the Soviet Union in that direction. We're not talking about elections here. We're talking about, uh, well, I did do some espionage, as you hinted, uh, but that's a separate issue I won't talk about. Uh, but we tried to 
tilt those who became the major advisors, such as Sagdeyev and Galeyev and the others. These were personal friends of mine because I worked with them in uh, the field of plasma physics and astrophysics. So I carried out those operations in coordination with the CIA uh, in the Soviet Union and waited until I was a guest of the Soviet Academy because that gives you a cover. Uh, nonetheless, I had a number of altercations with the KGB who were very suspicious of me, rightly so. Uh, and I, let's put it this way, I found it necessary to very quickly leave the Soviet Union in the matter of two hours. Right. And I got out on a BOAC flight. And uh, now, uh, leaping again, how come you were on the death list of the Unabomber? Oh, charming fellow. Uh, I uh, took part in a series I hoped to put together at UCI. We gave a two lecture series on risk and how to scientifically evaluate it and how we should think about it. Uh, and it was in a large auditorium with about 400 people, but there was a guy toward the back who kept staring intently at me. And, he, and after I gave the talks, he came into the crowd to ask questions, and I'd answer, never said a word, just stared at me the whole time. I forgot about it, right? Some years later, I opened up the LA Times in the morning, and there's his face. It's the Unabomber. And I thought, God, it was the same guy. That's amazing. Three days later, there's a knock on my door, FBI agent. Can you tell us why you're on his list? <laughs> and I said, I guess he didn't like my attitude toward risk. Uh, I, I, he said, well, what was he like? He said, he never said anything, but he, he had this glaring expression that, that I could not forget. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, you know, we had a list, and he was going down drawing out names. He killed two people, I think, and injured a bunch of others. And so the, I said, where was I on the list? And he said, uh, let's say that you were, you were three away. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, my colleague Michael Rose at, at UCI was also on that list, and he got the visit from the same FBI agent, and neither of us could explain it because he's an evolutionary biologist. I mean, this guy just didn't like his attitude toward evolution, I guess. Well, really crazy stuff. You, you've, you've escaped to death so far, uh, in spite of these uh, scrapes, yeah. um, but you're intending to escape it altogether by having your head frozen when you die, is that right, when you're that. nearly dead? Talk, uh, talk about risks. We all face the same risk, death. Well, hedge. Hedge your risk, right? Here, here right, only 10 miles away, is Alcor, a firm that will freeze your head in the hopes that you can be resuscitated in the future. What are the chances of that happening? I think they're very small. They're maybe one in a thousand, maybe worse, maybe even a little better. But what the hell? <laughs> What the hell? So I, I actually bought a life insurance policy, ironically, and have paid it off over a period of 20 years, so my head will be frozen. I'm thinking of going whole body, though, which only costs another 200000 or something. Right, right. <laughs> it's a, do, you, do you need the rest? <laughs> it's, it's to That's quote it. Raymond Chandler, it's the big sleep. <laughs> so I, I look, yeah. I'd like to see the future. That's why I talk about it so much. I'd like to see the future. Here's the chance. It's a very small chance, but, you know, where's the risk? You're already dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw this open to, to questions with, with just one more uh, comment, really, which is your new book, The Berlin Project, um, which I read uh, with great enjoyment. Uh, and uh, obviously you had a great in, inside knowledge of the Manhattan Project, and it's an alternative history of that, as I mentioned in the introduction. But it was your father-in-law who worked uh, very closely with Harold Urey. Is that uh, right? Do I remember That's that correctly? That's right. I, I had the idea for this novel because after my first wife died of uh, cancer, I married uh, Elizabeth Cohen, whose father was one of the founding figures in the Manhattan Project, Carl Cohen. This novel is actually a, a, an alternative history. And first, the first third of the book is exactly true for what happened in the Manhattan Project. But we made the wrong decision in 1942 about the method of separating uranium isotopes. We chose the wrong way, and it delayed the bomb by a year. In my novel, it, we don't lose that year. And you get a very different World War II because we use nuclear weapons in Europe. Carl Cohen, uh, who was my father-in-law, uh, uh, and here's a picture of him, uh, actually had a hand in the Manhattan Project and then some of the espionage that accompanied it. 
and uh, I got a chance to talk to him through the years about all this stuff. By the way, one thing I learned is the first alternative history novel I've ever written. Why not put in the pictures of the people you're talking about? I mean, it really existed. Why not just show the reader? And so it's full, there are about 45 photographs in here of various people, like Richard Feynman. This is his Los Alamos ID badge. I was able to get it from Los Alamos. He has this smirk on his face. You can read his character in that single <laughs> smirk. And it was full of juicy details because I knew almost everybody who's in this book, including Feynman. Uh, but I knew all the major figures in the Manhattan Project, Louis, you know, Leo Szilard, uh, and so on, because they were all at UCSD in the 1960s when I was there as a grad student. So it was actually a lot of fun to write this book, and it only took three years. And I can't uh, resist as we wait. To, do, do we have uh, um, Amanda and Alexa hovering with microphones? Yeah, could you come in, please? Can't resist the fact that, the, that your fir probably your first science fiction book called Timescape, that was how we first met, and you were kind enough to include me as a character. Yes. Uh, I re remember reading with some consternation, and there I was. But I was in good company. I think Murray Gellman is in it, and, and a certain Fred Boyle. Uh, <laughs> right. I've, I've written a number of novels about science uh, in which they're full of scientists I know. And one thing I've learned is nobody minds being included in a novel. No, the only depressing <laughs> thing was that it was I was still at King's College London in 1999, and... Uh, was yes. by then I moved on a couple of times. So. Uh, yeah, uh, but so the, what, well, once a, a science fiction novel about the future, by the way, also involving uh, climate change, um, has now become a historical novel since 1999. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the, the science fiction is going to catch up with you. I, I think we need to have some questions, and then because we've got to go for dinner. Um, so uh, uh, do, do, we, uh, do we have any questions from the audience now? And then we have uh, a couple of my assistants here who will uh, wave a microphone at you. Could you just wait for the microphone? Amanda, at the back there, if you would, because um, we, we are doing a video recording here, and it's always good to capture the questions as well. So, uh, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, you, you talked about asteroid missions. NASA had a mission called yeah. Asteroid Redirect Mission, where they would go and pick up a small asteroid, bring it to the neighborhood of the moon, right? Uh, yeah. Could you comment on that? Maybe, maybe the, the, the threat of an asteroid hit will more well, likely get us to do that rather than the economic imperative, like you talked well, about. You, the asteroid redirect mission was just still poorly defined. We don't know when it might happen. Uh, they're moving an asteroid the size of a Volkswagen. It will disintegrate in the upper atmosphere even if it does get to the Earth. So it's, they're not going to be moving anything large. For one thing, they don't have the, the rocketry or the ability to move anything large. They just want to see if they can do it and get it into close enough so they can study it, an asteroid really up close and do experiments, so forth, which is all necessary for learning how to prospect asteroids. So there's not going to be any immediate danger. Besides, you know, it's really kind of hard to hit the Earth. <laughs> We're, we are, of course, sitting here in the School of Earth and Space Exploration uh, building, and uh, the director of SESE, uh, Lindy Elkins Tanton, is uh, lead investigator yeah. on the uh, project that will send uh, a probe to the asteroid Psyche, yes. uh, which is uh, a metallic asteroid. Uh, and on your scale of uh, dollars, uh, I don't remember, but she told me that it's quite quadrillion or so it's got some weird you know why i lose track of, it's, of it's, the numbers of powers of 10 a lot of it anyway but very very valuable uh, but we bring it back in small doses uh, okay yes, another question it would be almost large enough to take care of the federal debt <laughs> <laughs> but yes what it will be at the time uh, anybody's so, guess so the uh, next yeah, I've sort of lost uh, yeah, control I'm, here, partly because no, I'm blinded. I've, Gentleman at the back. Yeah, um, so going to the question of geoengineering, um, I read somewhere about a controversial plan to put iron oxide into the oceans. Can you comment on that? And that experiment was done not very well in the uh, South Pacific, far South Pacific. Um, it had some ambiguous results. It's very act hard to actually measure when uh, CO2 or, or plankton are taken out of the ocean into the bottom because the bottom of the ocean is a long way down. 
Actually, I think that's a worthwhile experiment to do because it actually also increases fish production and wildlife production um, because it's a possibility. All these things are really interesting possibilities, but if you don't experiment, do experiments, you have no way to evaluate them. I mean, what really I'm afraid of is we're going to get into really tr bad trouble up there in the 2030s, and people are going to say, let's do some geoengineering, and we will not have done the preliminary experiments, so we'll be, we'll be shooting in the dark, frankly. And that's not what we should be doing. Right, there's a gentleman in the front with a question. Um, I have a question about the, the mining in terms of um, when we think about coal or CO2 emissions, we kind of know the consequences of mining stuff here on Earth with very little regulation, right? So what are some of the consequences that you imagine of mining these asteroids if, if, if we take the perspective that it's kind of like the, or even overfishing, right? So they're out there. It's like finding stuff in the ocean. We should be able to just take it. What are some, maybe some of the consequences of doing that, and how could we properly regulate it to make sure we don't exploit it? Well, I, I try to look on long horizons, but the asteroid reserves, particularly if you go even further into the asteroid belt, are estimated to be 10,000 to maybe even as much as a million times larger than the entire content of the crust of the Earth. We've already gone several centuries, and we haven't really run out of that. So. That's on a horizon of several centuries at a minimum. And by that time, the social organization of a solar system, which is being used as a resource source, um, are unknowable. I mean, I just can't imagine how you're going to run the solar system. But of course, Thomas Jefferson couldn't imagine we were going to get to the Pacific in less than 1,000 years. So I try to not overdo my predictions, because frankly, I don't know how you'd regulate it, or if you're going to need to, or even if we will need the same resources. After all, Thomas Jefferson didn't guess that we'd have a really urgent need for platinum. So to allow time for you, Greg, to sign books and maybe deal with the odd question when people are lining up, I'm going to limit this to one more. I just saw a hand go up over there. Uh, Alexa, if you could pass the microphone. So where are we on the hype cycle? We're mining asteroids. Like, where, where have we passed through the trough of disillusionment? We're, we're, growing, we're going up the first curve of the, of the hype cycle. People are starting to think, this looks like a good investment. Well, you always need that part. I'm not, I was not trying to suggest that you kind of jump over all those pieces. You need that. You need the investment to see how it's, it is. Then you start to see the limitations, and you go through oscillations. So we're at the very beginning of this. You will be hearing about this increasingly for the rest of your life. You may even see it done. I would like to see it done. Uh, but it's good. When they throw out your head, you might. Yes. <laughs> and I will be back. I'm, I'm going to make my investments carefully. <laughs> so in a thousand years, I'm going to own the entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Greg, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, Books available outside, uh, so thank you for all coming.